Welcome to the Word of Life Center podcast. It's our desire that today's message would equip and empower you to see the Word of God bring life to your life. All right, uh, we want to jump into... um, uh, I'm going to pick back up, if you will, or let me, it's not really pick back up. What we're going to do this evening is I want to continue to share along the same lines that we started this past uh, Sunday. We started a series called The Illusionist. How many was here Sunday? Man, it was good, wasn't it? I mean, the whole thing was good. Service was great, but we just we just got uh, we, we looked at our social media and and it was just like a record number of people that were commenting on it and and uh, on the on what we're teaching on and we're not done. We're just getting started. Really encourage you to bring friends, bring family, and and and, and those who weren't here Sunday. You may be saying, "What what what is the illusionist? What what is the what is the what is the series about?" Well, actually, it's about Satan. It's about Satan. And, and again, the series is not to create anxiety in us. Are you following me? Concerning the enemy. It, it's, it's to help us be aware. All right. Because as we said, as we said last Sunday in, uh, uh, in the introduction of it, um, Satan is the ultimate illusionist. He's the master illusionist. Here's the definition of an illusion. It's something that deceives by producing a false or misleading impression of reality. That's what an illusion is. It's something that deceives by producing a false or misleading impression of reality. So an illusionist is one who creates false or misleading impressions of reality. And Satan is the master at this. He's the master. So before I get on the teaching, let me, let, me, um, let me share a story with you. Some of my most fond memories uh, when I was a kid, my most fond memories were uh, hanging out at what well, I called him Papa, and uh, over in uh, near Spring Hill, a place called Sarepta, Louisiana. He was a country boy raised out in the country. He had this little, little small farm, and uh, I loved it. And, and one of the things I loved the most about being out there was during summer. And, and because when I went and, and got to stay with my papa, uh, we got to go fishing. And, and I loved as a kid. I, mean, I loved to go fishing. He, he really introduced me, introduced me to the outdoors. But before we could go fishing, before we could go fishing, we had to work in the garden. Papa was smart. He got free labor. I mean, he got out of us, out of his grandsons. He would, he would say, all right, boys, we get out there, get the work done. We'll go fishing, man. Give us the hoe. Give us whatever, the fertilizer, whatever, whatever we need to do because we want to go fishing, Papa. So we, 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 we worked in this garden, and he didn't have just a little bitty few rows. He had a, he had a garden that was probably as wide as this room and prob- probably almost as big as this entire room from the platform out where you guys are at. It was huge. It was massive. And um, I realized later in life that Papa didn't do this for a hobby. He, he, didn't, he didn't have this garden for a hobby. I, I didn't realize it when I was a kid. I, I didn't know that. I didn't realize that, that you know, he, just, he was a very uh, simple man. He wasn't highly educated. He worked for the uh, International Paper Company, retired from there. I uh, was very, very faithful there. Uh, but he also had five kids. And uh, so I realized later in life that Papa didn't do that and raise that garden for a, a, a hobby, that he raised that garden because it, his life and it really depended upon it. And the quality of his family, the quality of his life and his family life depended on that garden. And so I learned this from my, my grandpa. I learned this from Papa. He knew this. He knew if I take, Papa, if I take good seed, if I take seed and I plant it in good soil, my life is going to be better. If I take good seed, he knew that, and I place it in good soil, my life is going to be better. And that reminds me of a time that Jesus introduced this brand new concept to his followers. It's in Mark chapter 4. In Mark chapter 4. Now, now, we're going to get to the points in just a minute, but just stay with me because I'm building something here, okay? We're teaching, building something. So it reminds me of this concept. Take good seed, put in good soil. Life will be better. Jesus introduced this concept in Mark chapter 4. Take you back there. 
he is, uh, have just recently completed gathering his followers, the original disciples. I like to call them this. I like to call them the crew. Let's just modernize it a little bit. You know, the crew. Jesus had his crew. And, uh, but also, Jesus, in this moment, the first scene, if you will, he is standing before a crowd. There was just crowd, people everywhere on this hillside. And he preaches this message. The message about, is about a sower, a farmer, going out and just casting seed, just throwing seed. And then at the end of the message to the crowd, he, he makes this, some would say, maybe a peculiar statement. Peculiar. He said this. He said, hey, those who have ears to hear, let them, what? Let them hear. So the next scene, the next scene, Jesus is with the crew. He's with his disciples, the original ones that would go on and start the church that we're a part of today. Are you following me? I like to say it this way. Jesus was with his small group. True followers of Christ are part of a small group. Can somebody say amen? amen. If you, and if you really want to be like Jesus, you lead a small group. I don't think you can get any closer to being like Jesus than when you lead a small group, right? <laughs> I had to go there, right, Jake? I had to, right? So if you really want to be like Jesus, when we start talking about life groups and starting and leading groups, you got to be, if you want to be like Jesus, lead a life group. Well, think about it. That's what he did, right? A crew. You can even call your life group the crew. We'll go with that. I mean, we can. We'll go with that. All right. Are you with me? So he introduces them to the crew. He introduces them. And by the way, how do, you, how do we know who had ears to hear? You ever thought about that? How do we know? It's pretty easy. It's the ones who showed up afterwards. And they asked Jesus a question. They said, Jesus, tell us about this parable. Tell us about what you just talked about. When you were talking to the crew, we want to know more. That was good, but we know you've got more. We want that. Do you know it's important that we have ears to hear? That we just don't walk away from a message or reading a devotion and go, oh, that was good. But have God go say, God, Holy Spirit, I know there's something there. Talk to me. Are you following me? Can I better amen than that? So Jesus' response was this. Mark 4, 11, he said, he told them, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but those who are outside, everything is said in parables. The secret, this is the concept that he's introducing. It's brand new, but it's a secret. The secret of the what? The kingdom of God. So there have been books, volumes written about what is the kingdom of God, and I'm going to say it very simply, okay? The kingdom of God, in context of what Jesus is talking about here, the, the, the kingdom of God is, is God's plan for working in and through his people. It's, it's how God works in and through his people. This is his plan. This is, this is, this is the new concept. Are, are you with me? Are you following me? So I'll make it personal. I'm going to make it personal. God's plan, this is how God works in and through you. So he said, I'm giving you this concept. I'm giving you this kingdom thing. Are you, are you following me? This is what Jesus said in Luke 17, 21. It says, people will say, look, here it is, and there it is, because God's kingdom is where? It's where? Everybody say, it's, it's in me. It's here. Are you following? It's here. It's, here. it's right here. So, so basically, beforehand, Jesus was in a temple. I mean, God was in a temple. He was in the Holy of Holies, but God said, this is, Jesus said, I'm giving you a new concept. We're moving out of the temple, and we're going to a new temple. It's a bunch of temples. Aren't you thankful for that? Amen. This is so good. I, I love this. So good. And it's important that you get this, because listen to this. I'm gonna, this we're going to put this statement up on the screen for you. If you take a note, write this down. God's love, get this, please get this. God's love is automatic, but his influence is optional. God's love is automatic, but his influence is optional. Just because God loves you, and he does, doesn't mean that you will have his influence in your life. His love is automatic, but his influence is optional. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 6, 32. Just teaching the word here tonight. Teaching the word. Matthew 6, 32 and 33 says, For pagans run after all these things. Watch this. Your heavenly Father knows that you need them. That's love. He loves you. He's your Father. He loves you. 
Verse 33, but seek first his what? His kingdom. It's how he works, how he influences his people. Seek that, put that first, watch this, and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. That's his influence. So he says, he said this, he said, God knows, your father knows, your father who loves you, he knows what you need. He, he understands that, he gets that, but he says, but seek his way of doing life and his way of working in your life. Put that first. And his righteousness, making you right with him. Put that first and then, and what? Influence. God's love is automatic, but his influence is optional. And listen, it's not up to him if his influence is there or not. It's up to us. Praise God. All right, so now follow this. Follow this. So it's a new concept Jesus is introducing. So listen to how Jesus, listen to how Jesus is saying that his new concept works. Mark 4.20. So he's, 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 he's teaching this. He's sharing this. He's opening up what he had taught earlier. He's opening up and helping the disciples, his followers, the crew understand this. Mark 4.20. By the way, we teach this. This is a new curriculum that we're teaching in our school of ministry. We're, we're, teaching, we're teaching this. It's called the Genesis of Discipleship. It's a really good curriculum. And the reason we call it the Genesis of Discipleship is because um, this is the first thing that Jesus taught his disciples and unpacked for his disciples. So it's the beginning of discipleship, beginning of following him. Are you following me? How many have been to the school of ministry? How many's in school of ministry? How many's heard? We're, we're, how many can say it's pretty good? I mean, it's it's really, 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 really good. It, it really helps you. So if you've not been to school of ministry, you should go. That's part of the reason you should go because it'll really, really help you. Mark four twenty. This is how the con- this is how it works. How kingdom works. Others like seeds sown on good soil. They hear the word, they accept it, and they what? And they. And that that's pretty simple, right? Hear the word, you accept it. And you begin to experience the evidence of that truth. You, you hear the word, you accept it, and you, the, the potential in that promise is released in your life. Is anybody excited about that? I mean, is he interested in that? So we can say it this way, make it personal. If you place God's seed in good soil, your heart, listen to me, ladies and gentlemen, your life's going to be better. Your life is going to be what? better let me say it another way this is how god can write his story for your life how many is interesting in having god's story in your life listen everybody has a story but at the same time everybody wants a story everybody has a story but at the same time everybody wants a what a story how many how many has a, how many has a story that you would rather not bring up ever again you hope they lose the volumes somewhere. And, and how many, how many, how many, how many, how many wants a, a future that, that God is all in the middle of it? How many wants that? Man, I do. do you know, that's how this happens. It's how he begins to write this, this concept, this principle, this truth. It's, it's how, it's how his, he, his, his story becomes our story. Are, are you following me? John 10, 10, I, I really think this is, this is the story. This is the story all of us want. Not the first part, the second part. John 10, 10, the thief's purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. But I believe this is what everybody wants. My purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. How many would like that life? Now, I'm not talking about rich just in stuff. You, you can be rich in joy, rich in peace. Come on now. Rich in, in material things, too. God, God does not have a problem with that. But, but how many want some right, uh, rich in peace and some rich in joy? I mean, you can't put a dollar amount on peace. Come on now. How many's ever, how many's ever been just stressed out and you would pay, go, if I had a million dollars, I'd pay a million dollars for some peace right now? It's free. I said it's free. Actually, it wasn't free. Jesus paid the price on the cross so we could have it. So it's free to us, but that's why it's grace. Amen? Now, here, here's, here's what I want you to hear. I'm moving kind of slow through this because I want you to hear this. God's already given, given this life to you, but, but it comes in, in seed form. Are you following me? Every, please get this, everything God gives you, it comes in seed form. 
everything. How many are born again? The new birth came in seed form. Right? You heard the truth. You believed it. There was a miracle that took place in your life. You're a new creation in Christ. Old things are passed away. Why? Because you believed the seed. You believed that promise. And when you took that promise, you heard it, accepted it, and believed it. Guess what happened? God released the potential that was in that thing, and you are now born again. Can somebody get excited about that? So what happens is, is that, that your story begins to be rewritten when you begin to take God's truth about who God says you are. There's something that make, amazing that takes place. Let me tell you another quick story. Um, we lived in Scotland for a few years. And when our assignment, our time was up there, uh, I mean, it was, it was we, we were excited about coming back to the U.S., but, well, we had made some close friends when we were there. And one of the guys that, that I just has always, always has a place in my heart, his, his name, we called him Wee Billy. Wee, W-E-E, Willie, for in Scotland, that means little. Wee is little, right? Wee Billy, Wee, Wee, Wee Billy, he was about this tall, and he was about that wide. <laughs> he was just a little jolly Scotsman, you know, a little red, round, and just a little Billy. I mean, and, and I loved Billy. Billy was part of the church. He was so faithful. He wasn't on staff or anything, but he would be there early to open the doors to the church, turn the heat on, get all the... And every time you saw Billy, Billy was happy. He was smiling, and he had this very strong Scottish accent. When I first moved there, about half the time, I couldn't understand what he was saying, but I knew he was happy because he was smiling. I mean, he was just smiling. It was so great. So when we were getting ready to, to move, um, we had a going away. They had a going away party for, uh, for us uh, at the church. And, and, you know, we thought, oh, everybody said goodbye. And it was a great time. So maybe a couple days after that, we were um, getting ready to leave. We had an early flight out of Glasgow. And we had a little bit of a drive to get there. Someone was coming over to pick us up. And they were supposed to be there at like 4 a.m. Well, at 3.30, I hear someone knocking on the door, and I'm thinking, oh, my gosh, the people that are taking us to the airport have gotten here early. I opened the door, and it wasn't the person that's taking us to the airport. It was Billy. I said, Billy, what are you doing here? Now, I can't even begin. I can't even begin to imitate him, so I'm not even going to try with a Scottish accent. But he said, Pastor... He said, I couldn't bear the thought of you leaving and me not saying goodbye. Oh, man. Billy, come on in here, man. I hugged him. and He said, can I just stay here till you leave? I said, sure, Billy. My last memory of Billy was, sun wasn't up, of course, when we left. It's typical Scottish morning, it's real foggy. There was a light, light post. Billy was standing under it with his bicycle because he'd ridden his bicycle over there. Foggy. We're driving. It was like something out of a movie. I'm looking out of the rear class, and Billy's waving. Me too. <laughs> Billy's in heaven today. I did, did find that out. Let me tell you Billy's story, though. Before I met Billy, Billy was the town drunk. They said that Billy, you would have to step over Billy at times because he's passed out on the sidewalk. Everybody knew Billy as the town drunk. Everybody. But there was a day that somebody told Billy that his life could be better and that he could be set free from alcohol. Do you know what Billy did? Billy believed God's truth. He heard it. He accepted it. He grabbed a hold of God's promises in regards to who God said Billy is, not who Billy was. And listen to me, ladies and gentlemen. Billy's story got rewritten. Billy took good seed he put in good soil. He trusted it in his heart, and his life got better. That's what we're talking about here. Are you following me? Listen, you've got to believe this. You've got to believe this, and here's why. I'm talking about the illusionist, here's why. You've got to believe this, and the reason for that is 
I say, the reason I say that is Satan believes it. He knows it. He knows if you take good seed, God's truth and God's promises, and you put in good soil, that people's life's going to be better. It's going to be different. He knows that. He knows that. That's the reason in Mark 4, 14 and 15, Jesus says the farmer sows the word. Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, what, what happens? Come on now. As not, not, not an hour later, not a day later, not five years later. When? As soon as they hear it, what? Boom. Yeah. The word that's sown in their heart. This is why Peter said, listen, be alert. Listen, this is why Peter said it. This, Satan knows this trend. He knows this principle. That's the reason he comes after the word. Are you following me? And that is the reason the foundation of these teachings that, that we've done last Sunday and tonight is 1 Peter 5, 8, where it says, Be alert and of sober mind. Watch this. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to what, to what, to what, to. He's looking. Now, this is fall, right? One of the things that happens this fall is for lots of people, they, 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 they just like Christmas. Fall is like Christmas. And that's for folks who love to hunt. I mean, and I'm, I'm kind, of, kind of there. I, 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 really, I, really enjoy, I really enjoy hunting. If you, if, you, if, you, if you don't like hunting and all that, I'm praying for you. <laughs> Man, because those things sure do taste good. When you, anyway, anyway, but here, here's the thing about hunters. Here, here's the thing about hunters. Are you, you follow me? Here's the thing about hunters. Hunters are illusionists. Because we put clothes on that make us look like trees. We put scents on hoping to make ourselves scentless. Then we take other scents to make us smell like things that we're not. And then we have calls that we use to make us sound like animals. Are you following me? I, I saw this. This is, this is a funny. I saw this not long ago. When you, when you let your wife put out deer corn, look what she did. She spelled out with a corn, it's a trap. She's telling the deer it's a trap. Isn't that... And here, here's, here's, one I, here's one I want to point out to you. Everybody listen to me. Listen to me. Listen. The enemy is a great illusionist. Satan is a great illusionist. And he's phenomenal at setting traps. I want to talk to you about three traps real quick. Three traps. Just three. Number one is the trap of anger. Anger. Here's what I've noticed about people. And, and I can say this because I have experienced this and done this and i'm ashamed to say it personally anger for some people anger is an ally anger is an ally and because they'll use their anger to manipulate to get what they want they'll use anger to manipulate and I, i'm ashamed to say it but i've done that and I've done that to my wife. And, and don't worry, I did get permission to say this before. It's like, you're confessing this in front of, oh, we hope you told Miss Sandy, all right? You talked about it, I should say. But early in our marriage, uh, I, I figured out that, 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 that Sandy could not stand it when I didn't talk to her. When I got mad and wouldn't say anything to her, she, 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 she couldn't stand it. And I figured that out. I saw that. So guess what John did? When I would get angry, guess what I would do? I would just, yeah, that's, I'm going to say another way. <laughs> Went on the second row, said, shut up. <laughs> yes, I would shut up, right? But I wouldn't do it because she wanted me to shut up. I would do it because she didn't want me. Because when I would shut up, I would shut her off. And she couldn't stand that. So I would use that and I would manipulate her to get my way. See, some people use anger as an ally because what happens is they'll either shut up or they'll show out. And they'll do that to get their what? Because they know if I, sh if I show out, if I get loud and angry, I can back them down. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, that is manipulation. And never use anger as an ally. Because the reality is anger is 
an enemy. Here's what Ephesians, Ephesians, uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verses 26 and 27 says. If you are angry, don't sin by nursing your grudge. Don't let the sun go down with you still angry. I love this part. Get over it quickly. Watch this. You can say it's not an ally. It's an enemy. For when you are angry, you give a mighty foothold to, and he don't play. It's getting kind of quiet in this spirit-filled, Holy Spirit, God-loving, God-worshiping, Jesus-fearing church. Some of you are like, could you please go into something else? Okay, I will. Envy. It's another trap. This is what Ecclesiastes 4.4, 4, why a very wise man wrote this. Ecclesiastes 4.4, 4, Solomon wrote this. He said, then I observed that the, most people are motivated to success because they envy their neighbors. And I've noticed something about people. This is what happens. That people are motivated to success because they envy their what? Listen to what he says, but this too is meaningless. It's like chasing the wind. When you, when you, when a person, when envy is this. Envy is when I measure myself uh, and compare myself to somebody else. And I say, I, I, I want to be that. Everybody look at me. Envy is a trap. I'm going to meddle a little bit right now, okay? Everybody listen to me. One of the greatest platforms, let me just put it, it might be set this way. The, the, the trap is so broad and it's so easy and it's so available today. So available. It's called social media. Everybody look at me. <laughs> you do realize that the pictures that you're seeing of people, <laughs> they're the highlight reels. They're, 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 they're taking pictures. They're taking pictures of their family, and their, their, their family's all smiling, and they're all great, and they're on vacation. It's just beautiful. They took 74 pictures and used 18 filters to get that. <laughs> and you didn't see what happened before all of that. You didn't see them cussing at their kids, trying to get their kids in place, because I want to show the world how great of a family we have. And so you look at that, you look at that, and then you look around at your kids, and we go, we're a bunch of losers. <laughs> Listen, you don't measure yourself by what somebody else has. You don't measure yourself by what somebody else does. You measure yourself by who God says you are, and that's it. You can look to others for inspiration, but not imitation. You can look to others for inspiration, but not imitation. Your story can't be somebody else's story, and somebody else's story can't be yours. Amen? Envy's a trap. Another trap is worry. You're like, oh, it just gets worse. You go from anger, and you're like, oh, we have a problem with anger. Envy, I'm doing all right thing with uh, envy. And you're going, oh, my goodness, he's got to talk about worry. I, that's mine. I'm not going to talk long about it, but worry, uh, Proverbs 12, 25. <laughs> worry in the heart of a man weighs it down, but a good word makes it glad. In other words, worry affects a person's heart. That's what Jesus said. Mark 4, 19, he says, but they start worrying about the needs of, the li uh, of this life. They are fooled by the desire to get rich and to have all kinds of other things. So the message, the truth, the promise, God's word, that has all this potential, it gets choked out and never produces anything. Are you following me? So the, the question is this. The question is this, and I'm going to wrap up here. The question is this. How do, we, how do we measure how we're doing when it comes to the enemy? Because let me just say this. That, you know, remember in 1 Peter it says to resist the enemy? Resisting the enemy often is resisting staying angry. Are you following me? You can say, I rebuke you, devil. I rebuke you, devil. I rebuke you, devil. You can say that all day long. But if you've got anger, you can rebuke till your rebuker is broken. <laughs> I mean, it's, fall, it's on the floor. You've got to go on 
Amazon Prime and order you another rebuker because you have worn your rebuker out. You can say it all day long, but if you got anger and you're manipulating, using that anger to manipulate, he's not going anywhere. Are you following me? But I got authority. You do have authority, but you also have the word of God that says, get over your anger real quickly because it gives place to the devil. So you use that authority, the authority of the word of God. Are you following me? To forgive the way that you've been forgiven. Are you following me? All right. So how do you measure how we're doing? How do you, how do you just kind of measure this? How do you monitor this? Well, you just monitor your heart. Proverbs 4.23 says, Above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. Everything. How many of you pay attention to your checking account? Does anybody ever check your checking account? How often? Every day. That's good. Why? Because it's important. You won't know how much money's in there, or sometimes how much not much money is not in there. Depends on the day, right? What's something else that you monitor very closely? Help me. Gas in your car. You've got to monitor that, don't you? No gas, no go. It's pretty simple. No gas, no go. You monitor that. Why don't we monitor one of the most important and valuable things that we have in our life, and that's our heart? Why don't we pay closer attention to that? Why don't we monitor that? Because that's what keeps the soil good. That's what makes sure that you get the soil good. Because if you put good seed in good what? Soil, your life's going to be what? Better. Better. How, how, do you, how do you do that? Monitoring it. Can I tell another quick story real quick? I'm trying to get done here. I had this dog. I love him. Loved him. He's in heaven. If you don't believe that dogs go to heaven. Mine did. And when we get there, I'm going to tell you. See, my dog Chip. My lab, my chocolate lab, he is right here. Anyway, Chip was a great dog. One of the problems he had is he would eat anything. Anything. He was like a bottomless pit. So one summer I was raising some tomatoes. And uh, I, I, every morning I would get up and I would look out my back and I could see those tomatoes. I see they're growing and I, they're green. I'm thinking, ooh, praise the Lord, it won't be long. Slice them babies up, salt, pepper, it's going to be good. So one afternoon I got home. I look, because I'm thinking, today's the day. I'm going to pull some of those first tomatoes off. And they weren't there. So I walked outside, and I looked at my tomatoes, and I could see just like something had eaten them. And so Chip has walked out beside me. And I turned around, and I looked at Chip. And he was older, and it's like we had a relationship. It was weird. But I could look at him. It's almost like... I could tell what he was thinking, and he knew what I was thinking. Because when I looked at him, he had this look. His ears kind of dropped like, I didn't do it. I did not do it. Because I'm thinking, he's eating my tomatoes. And then I thought, surely not. So then I began to monitor something. One afternoon, I was sitting out there, and I noticed this big rat came underneath the back fence. Yeah, me too. Big old, not a mouse. I mean, this dude, when he ran across the backyard, the ground shook. That's how big that rat was. <laughs> went over there, and guess where he went? He went to my tomato plants. So we took care of that rat. All right, my, my point is this. My point is this. What you value, what's important to you, you'll give your attention to it. You'll give your attention to it. Listen to me, ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen your heart is one of the most valuable things that you have. So how do, you, how do you monitor your heart? It's very simple. You listen to what you say. Listen to your words. Luke 6.45 says, A good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart. An evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. Watch this. What you say flows from what is in your heart. So you just listen to your heart. And when, it, when envy, oh, I wish, I wish, I wish, I would, I wish, I would so much like to be like them. When you hear that, you go, no, 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 no. I'm not falling into that trap. I'm going to resist the devil. 
I'm not going to get caught. Anger, when anger starts coming up and you're tempted to hold on to that grudge, you go, no, 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 anger, no, 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 that's a trap. No, my words are angry. Nope, they're done. I'm not going to speak that way. I'm not going to say that way. I'm not falling into the trap. Not going to do it. Worry, worry. How are we going to do this? How are we going to, I don't know. Oh my goodness. What, what's going to happen? No, no, no. I, I, I'm listening to my words. I'm monitoring my heart. Nope, 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 nope. Not going to fall for that trap. I'm going to resist the devil because I know if I put good seed in good soil, my heart's going to be better. My life is going to be different. My story is going to be good. Amen? What's the moral of the story? Point of the message. Guard your heart because Satan is coming after the truth about you. That's what God is saying tonight. Thanks for listening to the Word of Life Center podcast. You can connect with us on Facebook and Twitter or at our website, wordoflifecenter.org.